<laughs> Attention Earthlings, do not attempt to adjust your dial. You are about to voyage into the marvelously mystifying. Join us as we navigate the enigmatic waters of consciousness, delve into the arcane realms of the occult and the paranormal, and converse with captivating beings from across the universe. Prepare to expand your mind, challenge your perceptions, and journey into the unknown with your guides, Panicula and HP Hovercraft. The frequencies of strangeness await. Welcome, Welcome to, to Dizzy, Dizzy Spell. Dizzy Spell. Dizzy Spell. Greetings, Earthlings. I'm Panicula. I am HP Hovercraft. I almost said I'm HP Hovercraft, so we're off to a good start. That's good. <laughs> Just keep it all in. <laughs> I love it. Here we are. We're in We Own This Town Studios. Yes. This is the beginning of a new era. A for, new dimension. Yeah. A new timeline, a new alternate dimension. Yeah. A different um, path in the multiverse. Yeah. We're, we've split off. We're maybe concurrent to a timeline where we are still on the radio. Ooh, I like that. And maybe that will eventually twine back and our paths will cross and the people that have still been doing the radio will now will then do a podcast and we'll circle back to radio eventually cool right okay and who who's to say who's to say that's what i always that's what i've always said is who's to say i look forward to finding out <laughs> yep so for those who maybe haven't heard the Confused. radio show never listened to our radio show ever i have no idea what we're talking about welcome earthling this is the dizzy spell We've actually been doing this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have hosted Dizzy Spell for, I think it was five and a half years on community radio here in Nashville. And HP uh, joined the Dizzy crew. I salute you, the sir. Same point. Who Three knows how long? Three years ago? Yeah, so I, I kind of, a good way that I keep track of the time is how old Casper is. Oh, right. And so he's doing it a little bit now and i think it was my first year about halfway through my first year that i joined on so or the beginning so you yeah, started the january before years. he was born yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well all of that is to say that if you have not ever listened to the dizzy spell we like to talk about the mysterious aliens occult influences weird stuff that's going on in the world otherworldly phenomena Occasionally, uh, movies, horror movies, totally sci-fi movies, just general. I'm a big fan of the Oscars and things like that. Yeah, we love to talk about Coming weird up. things happening in the news or like futurist concepts that are like becoming reality before our eyes. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're experiencing a lot of that. Yeah. At one point, I felt like all we could do was just talk about news because so that much. That was true. There was a period of time where it was like, <laughs> we can just talk about funny things that are going on or weird <laughs> things that are going on every week and it'll be fine. Yep. But yeah, we're, we're changing it up. Mm -hmm. This is a new era for us. We're going to be trying to do a episode every other week to start. Who knows what's going to go on from there. We are pre-recording some of these. Yes. So they're going to come out a little bit later than when we initially recorded them. Maybe in the future, that won't be the case, but some of the topical things might be a little outdated at the time, but mm -hmm. that's all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this podcast is going to be available on all streaming yes. avenues, devices, Journeys. One of the advantages of, of making the change over, it's going to be more available than we were before. Mm -hmm. So if you're a previous listener that was always tuning in on Tuesday nights, we appreciate you. Um, thank you for following us over here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's a little easier for you to stay caught up on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks for coming along for the ride. Yeah, I think this is going to be like a cool new way to archive what we've been working on. Because uh -huh. I feel like we've amassed like a really amazing body of work that we've already covered on the show. And so it'll be cool to kind of um, bring that to the podcast world. Format. Yeah. Sure. So I'm excited. And so you can also, I think, just listen to our show, if I understand correctly, right at dizzyspell.show, our new website. Great. As of now, it doesn't even exist. You're hearing this in the future when our cool website That's looks true. really awesome. One of the advantages of the podcast <laughs> format, we can talk Amazing. about things with the intention of doing them, which makes <laughs> them real. I guess we shouldn't talk too much about stuff and then it not happen. But the website will definitely happen. It'll happen. <laughs> um, also, when you're listening to this, I will be running for city council. Ooh. 
Ooh. <laughs> oh, I would vote for you. <laughs> Very fun. And as always, you can follow our journey on Instagram at Dizzy Spell World. Cool. Um, did you hear about this fireball in the sky over Nashville? No, I saw this in okay. the outline and I was like, what are you talking about? I just saw like some Reddit posts that were like, did you see this crazy thing? Apparently it was a meteor, but I just wanted to bring it up. It's not like a news roundup worthy thing, but I was just curious if you had fireball heard about the crazy the fireball in the sky. Um, I did see green laser in the sky. What? Twitter. You, what? I don't know. In Nashville? I think that I want to say that it was in Nashville, but it might have not been. Whoa. Um, it might have been like a, a surrounding. I get recommended mm. a lot, uh, just like random other southern cities okay. on Reddit and stuff. Yeah. And I feel like it, one of them was just like crazy green lasers in the sky. And I was like, well, that's explainable. You know, like <laughs> <Yes>. it's not, <laughs> they're not, it's not going to be that. We're not that lucky. I love it. I love it. Okay. So was there any other like differences we want to talk about? I mean, I guess it's um, probably stating the obvious that we say we're not really going to be able to play as m- much of the music that we used to. Less music, uh, more room for news, more room for keeping up with current events. More, more room, room for, for cussing. For cussing. If we want. Yeah. I, I don't know if we will. We don't know. We might want to keep it PG still. Should we just break it now? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> just get it out of the way. I want it to happen Just naturally. Just one cuss? Okay. You know? I All really right. want it to mean something. Fair enough. I guess. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. We can also just talk as long as we want to, which is cool. That's true. <laughs> so one of the major things that I was thinking about was like not having breaks or mm-hmm. having to think about like going long on something uh-huh. or really having something to say and yeah. being like, okay, we got to take a break to talk about this or or have a music break or whatever. Um, yeah. So we're really be going to be able to go long on, on some of the things that we really wanted to. I don't know. I think that it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be more fun. I hope. Ooh, I think so. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're also now a part of a podcast network. It feels very official. We got the team. We got a team. Mm-hmm. We have a producer, Michael, who's wonderful and letting us hang out in his office when he's not at work. Yeah. That's really nice. <sighs> okay. I feel like there was one more difference about the radio show thing that I was going to bring up, but I don't remember what it was. We'll come back to it. Oh, yeah. Duh. Natural segue here. We're going to have segments. Yes. <laughs> I guess is totally. how you would put it. Yeah. So we're going to try to keep it really, we were really loose with kind of how we did things yeah. on Dizzy Spell. We were really interested in talking about current stuff and it was just kind of like you're limited when you really only have 30 to 40 minutes of actual talking time. Plus you have other things you have to say, like PSAs and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just a different thing. Um, so we're going to kind of ke- try to keep it structured. We're going to check up on the, is it, do you say it? The New Fork? I like calling you, it New Fork just because yeah, that fork. sounds fun. We're going to be really trying to check up on the UFO happening. Reporting center, yeah. We're going to really keep that consistent. We want to do listener mail. We're yes. going to call them DQs. DQs, direct queries. Direct quer- queries, dizzy questions, whatever yes. have you. We should make up I love it. different all the different things that it like could be that are oh. DQs. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Um, you know, so we got two so far. We just got to keep them going. Uh, so definitely <laughs> submit questions to us. We want to do that every week. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably pretty consistently be talking about current stuff, stuff that we're into, checking up on movies that we might have watched recently. Yeah. Uh, and then keeping it going with a researched or uh, like larger format topic that we want to talk about we're mm-hmm. going to keep it fresh with interviews we're going to have yes. people on yes um, yes yes we're just gonna we're gonna mix it up dizzy spell so it'll be cool 20.0 2024 let's do it today i will say so i uh read about read a bunch about the gulf breeze ufo incident i know you got something that you're yes. bringing to I'm the gonna table i'm going to talk about the kentucky meat shower cool that sounds crazy <laughs> It sounds like something it sounds inappropriate, I'm be honest. I, <laughs> it's not like sexual. Cool. I don't Thank think. God. 
maybe like nature sexual. Speaking of nature sexual, I I know you're in the middle of kind of saying what we're going to expect out of today's episode. <laughs> but speaking of nature sexual, have you seen Annihilation? I finally watched yes, Annihilation. Of course. Oh my gosh, that movie is amazing. Great, great, great movie. <laughs> so good. I can't believe it took me so long to watch it. Yeah, Alex Garland. I've liked all his movies. Mm, I've so only far. seen The Beach and Ex Machina. Ex Machina is amazing. Super good. Um, have you you haven't seen Men? No. Okay, so he did Men. I need to watch Men that. Men is crazy. I need to watch that. And one. it's like crazy, maybe in like a bad, like a not. Like a this is maybe too much mm-hmm. kind of way, mm-hmm. I guess. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Okay, it's, I'm writing this down. It's it's a lot, and then he's got that movie Civil War coming out. This I think it's this year. What? What's that? It's just called Civil War. It seems like it is like a it's like a modern like if the it's like a modern day Civil War movie. Oh, I guess. And they've published like like in promotional materials, put out like maps where it's like Texas and California are part of like one union and then there's like other what and people were freaking out on the internet going texas and california never work out never work together but it's a fictional <laughs> movie guys it is not it's not the real and okay. who you don't know what they're gonna do in the movie okay i don't feel like i want to watch that movie though i don't either but because i like all his other movies yeah. so much like i okay i you can tell me if i should watch it in that it'll be something that i want to watch <laughs> yeah you know yeah on cool. brief brief movie talk, have you seen yes. Poor Things? No. Okay. Should well, I? We'll talk about well, it Well, because we kind of talked about how I have not seen any of your Ghost Land yes. movies. Really? And Still. I need to like watch. I know. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I am, am so I doing sorry. Here? I feel like I've been doing so much catching up on stuff I haven't seen before, too. I just watched The Burbs. I've been thinking about how I want to watch The Burbs. You know what? The Burbs reminds me of this story that i'm going to talk about really yeah, Ooh, okay and it's making me yeah it's so you've made, seen the burps yeah okay you were saying you want to watch it again yeah okay cool i yeah i just saw it for the first time it's pretty great watch poor things we'll talk about it in the future yes. i think that it's dude's best movie gotta do it um but watch all his other movies i, also. I gotta catch up um i also this is so has nothing to do with anything i watched freddie got fingered for the first time you ever seen that movie wait you had never seen it never before? seen it never seen it a little too young a little too young to have like got the wave of it I actually got exposed to that movie when I was too young, but let me tell you that I watched it so many times. I think that I think that that's the thing is that I think that you're totally colored by wh- what age you were when you saw that. Yeah, because I was like, this is this doesn't Awful. mean anything. To me. Yeah, like what is what is this? It's nothing. They don't make movies it's like just that anymore. Totally that's for ridiculous. Sure. And then I had like a good friend of mine be like, who was like a champion of it. I texted him and I was like, why? Why should I care about this? And he's like, it's a perfect, it's a perfect summation of pre 9 11 ethos, and it's a data masterpiece. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, it's not like it's it's not intentionally that. <laughs> and like, but then I started to think like, is this? Am I just biased? Because I have seen all of the latter Fairly Brothers movies, like uh, Me, Myself, and Irene, and Movie 43, and Stuck on You, and all these things that are like gross out, or like even Scary Movie, for example, that mm-hmm. all came after this. Mm-hmm. Like, and I've just seen those, and so this is like the source material. Ah. Uh, and I now watch it and go, this is just dumb. <laughs> and, but really, it like, it like, laid the first stone for Did, all of these you know but didn't right? like dumb and dumber before that too though but like, like but dumb and dumber is like a different cut from a different cloth because it's not <laughs> the same sort of, it, it is a little okay it's not like, quite as mindless but like i it, like freddy got fingered is more like monty python okay like okay interesting kind of deal <laughs> i don't like, see the like comparison freddy got fingered is like jackass like, yes. You know. Yes. No, but but Freddy Got Fingered is very Monty Python, I'd say. I never thought about it that there, way. Like, the, like uh, there's so much of that where it's a story, but it's skits also. Mm-hmm. Like, it's yeah, mostly true. like it's skits. That's a good point. See, here's the thing, is that I didn't <laughs> like this movie, but I have a lot of thoughts about Clearly. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on. For, I can't talk. Well, I knew that I was going <laughs> to... 
<laughs> okay, I just want to. Can I bring one more movie up? Yeah. Okay, so you've been to my dad's cabin. I went to my dad's cabin this weekend. Yeah, it was so foggy around this cabin that it was a complete whiteout, and it was like we were in a video game loading screen mm. when you walked on like the balcony, like you were just literally in a white fog. And so Silas was like, "Ooh, this reminds me of Silent Hill," mm. and I was like, "Oh yeah, that movie's so good." And he was like, "Wait, there's a movie of it." And I was like, cool, so we're watching that right this instant. So while we're in this like creepy <laughs> fog that stayed the entire time that we watched the Silent Hill movie. Okay, that movie is still amazing. I don't think it I've is... seen the movie. Okay, the guy who made it petitioned to Konami to get the rights to the movie for five years. And they finally agreed because he went out and shot part of the movie on his own dime and then showed it to him. And they were like, okay, All right, cool. Dude. He did such a good job that things from the movie ended up in the future video games. And he made another movie after like a, a second one. And the third one's coming out this year. Really? Yeah. The first movie is flawless. It's very well done. Like highly recommend really? it. It's cool. Cause it's like Japanese but in America, it's like in West Virginia, and it's just this very interesting, like kind of Japanese horror vibe. But you're in like this very like Appalachia, uh -huh. creepy mining town. I don't know. It's it's super cool. Highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. Cool. Yeah. Let's check it out. Yeah, super good. All right. So, do you want to get into some DQs? Should we yeah. die? What do we got? Quickly. I'm interested. Okay. In so, how about we have you pick one out of this bag? I can't believe we have a bag. We have an actual mail bag. Let's get it. So these were submitted on our Instagram, and we're going to try and post before we record episodes and ask people to like send us questions, but you can always DM us at Disney Spell World on Instagram if you want to ask us a question or talk about some sort of topic or something. Some of these are a little out there, so hopefully this makes sense, what I wrote I can't down. believe we have any. So I appreciate it. We have a couple. Yeah, thanks. Um, what is the most benevolent cryptid? Ooh. What Thoughts, HP? <sighs> That's a hard one. Um, I, well, immediately I want to say, like, I want to say Bigfoot. Okay. Right away. Okay. And I know that maybe it's. That's a no. <laughs> well, Yeah. <laughs> But, so, how influenced are you by false reports? What? You know what I mean? Like, how, mean? how influenced are you by, like, movies and things? Well, I know, like, people who... I literally know people who said that, like, Bigfoot, like, threw things at them. Sure. Okay. Like, he's, like, aggressive. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, th I'm just thinking about, like, OG Bigfoot. Okay. What'd you got? Mothman warned people before the bridge collapsed. Like, he's seen as, like, a portent yeah. of doom. That's interesting. You know? I don't know. So he's, like, giving people a heads up. I mean, obviously, they couldn't decipher his message because they still died. So maybe not. Man, I just don't got a good answer. Yeah. There's, like, certain strains of alien that are, like, the benevolent ones. Yeah, but I wouldn't... Uh, I, wouldn't I forget which ones are which. Call them cryptids. True. Fair. Yeah. I feel like I need a list in front of me. Okay. Maybe we can report back. Yeah, we'll report back on that one. Yeah. I'll do hmm. we'll do a <laughs> we'll do a cryptid ranking by benevolence in the future. I'm just gonna like really quick search are there any nice cryptids? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna see what comes up. Ooh, are there any lesser known peaceful Peaceful cryptids? Or nice I mean cryptids? just like what about like Someone said jackalopes sound pretty peaceful unless you scare them or are hunting them. They like whiskey and will sing and can join your campfire sing along. <laughs> They're usually a tenor. <laughs> Someone on Reddit. Great. They're usually a tenor. <laughs> okay, so people keep saying the Fresno Nightcrawlers, but I actually don't know this one. What's the Fresno Nightcrawlers? I don't know. Let's just, you know, I let's feel just like do cryptids a little inherently the... are like are malicious. That's like the whole the whole dealio. I don't know. I think misunderstood. Okay, I don't know. So in the cryptid wiki, doing some on the on the moment research here, the Fresno Nightcrawler, known as the Fresno Alien, is a cryptid that made two appearances: one in Fresno, California, one in Yosemite National Park. In both sightings, it's only seen in video footage. Let's see what happens. <sighs> oh, what about uh, fucking Lockie Loch Ness? 
Well, what has he done? Nothing. Exactly. He's chilling. Hmm. Dude, I don't see anything about these night crawlers other than they just like walk around and creep people out. I don't know. I might have to do a little more research. How about the Loveland Frog Man? Oh, maybe. I don't know. Why is that one nice? I mean, how, uh, frogs are generally <laughs> non-invasive and friendly. That's fair. I'd say I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Nessie. Okay, just like based on like general vibe. Yeah, that seems fair. You know. Yeah. Never, like, there's no, like, for him being a lake, like, mostly, he's just shy. Yeah, that's you know? so true. He's just, he's just chilling out there. He's not bothering anybody. In fact, leave him alone. Stop looking for me. I exist in a different plane of existence than you, and I only tear through the realm occasionally. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Big, I take back Bigfoot. I'm, I was a fool for saying Bigfoot. Bigfoot has caused all sorts of ruckus. <laughs> Have you yeah. seen that movie, uh, the Bobcat Goldweight movie that no. is about? I like should. Blair Witch Project, but Bigfoot. No. It's just scary. Wait, it's a horror movie. Yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't think I knew that it was a horror movie. That's fun. Okay. Well, do we want to do one more DQ? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay, I'll pick this up. Yeah, you pick. Who are the men in black, and why do they hate fun? Men. They are a secret organization that is very real, that is not really known, um, and they, it's their, they're not allowed to have fun. Do you think they work for the government, or do you think they're their own governing body no, that is like outside? Definitely. 100%. Do you think it's like one of those they situations? They control the government. Mm. Like, okay, something to think about there. They control all of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Like all the world. Like governments. if, like um, if you are saying like that they're like a branch of the government, it's reverse it, and it's the government is a branch of that. You know <laughs> of the I mean? Men in Black. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was thinking it was more like you know how there's been there were all the the hearings last year about where they were basically like okay well if there's any secret UFO programs in our military you better come out and tell us. And obviously, I'm sure no one did. Mm. But I just imagined, like, the Men in Black is one of those programs. That's how I saw it. But but it would make more sense if it was, like, internationally entwined, for sure. <laughs> and without what we think of as borders. Because we're all just citizens of Earth, man. And going further, the Men in Black movies are a psyop to get us to not believe that those... That they're legit. actually legit. Yep. No, that's a real. That's real. All right. No, well, now this podcast's not going <laughs> to exist for much longer. Do you? <laughs> Detonation in <laughs> dead nine. Um, I forgot my little sound box. But next time we're gonna we're gonna have we some gonna cool we're gonna explosion have sounds right there. Record them after. <laughs> All right. Okay. Do you want to hit up New Fork? Yes, what do we got? Okay, so for those of you who are new to the Dizzy, N-U-F-O-R-C dot org, or the National UFO Reporting Center is awesome. They're dedicated to the collection and dissemination of objective UFO data. And one of the best things about their website is you can go and go to an index of all their UFO reports that are accessed in uh, four different ways are indexed by date, state and country, shape of UFO, and date posted. So what do we think we want to do? Do we want to do something that seem close to where we are right now? Yeah, I feel like we should start by look up Nashville for sure. We'll start there. On it. Cool. I'm going to kind of go to like recent ones, see if anything stands out okay going forward i think that we should definitely reference local news Mm -hmm. check those out cross-reference as you may but i'm gonna wait say that again well if we're reporting on a certain thing Mm -hmm. and it's you know say something like you well you're talking about the the fireball yes national fireball yes Mm cross-reference yeah like make sure it's not the iss or whatever Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go recent. I'm gonna see anything jumps at me. You do you do you. All right, I I'll kick it off here. This first one is from December 19th, and it says 
This is from in like around Nashville, Tennessee, in Antioch, Tennessee. And it says, I looked over at the moon as a plane went southwest. I turned to sit down and noticed an object flashing in the sky. He got several videos and one still, but I don't know, for some reason I'm not seeing the videos attached to this one. Although we did one time find a way to like look at all the oh, man. attachments and that was very cool too. We'll have to figure that out again. I feel like sometimes the people write the thing but don't attach it, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Or like don't understand how or whatever. Um, okay, so Gallatin, Tennessee, this one was February 3rd for 15 to 20 seconds over water around Old Hickory Lake in Gallatin, Tennessee. This craft was a teardrop shape and was black. They estimated the size to be about the size of a small van, and they estimated it was going about 50 miles per hour. They said it was black on top and white on the bottom and shaped like a computer mouse. Saw it at about 50-ish feet above the water, moving around 50 miles per hour in a straight line over Old Hickory Lake. It went under a bridge, and I lost sight of it a few seconds later. I was inside, so I couldn't hear any sound. There was no smoke and no lights. Damn. That's right by my house. Weird. That's creepy, right? Not to dox myself at all. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) That's pretty vague. This one's a little long, but I feel like it is so well put together Mm -hmm. that I just gonna I'm just gonna read it. Okay. This is from Shepherdsfield, Kentucky. Okay. Several sightings over several years. This is a post I made on Facebook today. I am a retired soldier, U.S. Army MSG E8 with 20 years, and also retired department of the Army Civilian GS11 Step 5, 19 years. Can you help me? Did you ever see something that was flying in the visible sky above you? Was it making moves that you would not think a regular airplane could do? Was it too fast? Was it too slow? Did it stop and seem to just hover in place? (laughs) Was it a bright spot in the daytime sky? Or if at night, was it a light or several lights? Could you see it plain enough to identify just as what you saw? Taking all this info into consideration, you might have seen an unidentified flying object (laughs) or a UFO. Of course, the people in higher places have started calling them by other names. That way, it places them a step or two higher up the ladder of scientific knowledge than we lesser humans. To me, I will stick with Flying Saucer for the time being. The first modern human to make an official report described them as looking like saucers skipping across the water at several thousand miles an hour. Hence, Flying Saucers appeared on the pages of the tabloids the very next day. The same year, the wreckage of something was scattered across some 200 yards near the Army airfield near Roswell, New Mexico. It was first reported to be the remains of a flying saucer, but the Army said it was just a weather balloon. The pictures of the wreckage published in the newspaper certainly did not show a balloon of any type. I was just 11 years old, and when Dad discussed the incident with me, from his words, I was totally convinced that a flying saucer had crashed and that the Army was hiding the fact from the public. I was then, and still am today, at 88 years old, a firm believer in UFOs. I have seen several objects in the skies over my head that certainly fits flying saucers, UFOs, UAPs, or whatever they want to call them. They are real. Many people have seen them more than they have seen them. They just didn't say anything about it. And way back before TV and radio, many thousands more saw and drew their pictures on the walls of the caves where they lived. Some dating back many thousands of years before record history. I remember building a UFO out of balsa wood and covering it with aluminum foil. (laughs) I thought it looked very real, but it was just 12, and I was proud of my work. Since that time, I have had several sightings of things that were flying, and I could not identify. Therefore, I called them UFOs. My first sighting, (laughs) I was still in high school, and it stayed until after dark. We were rehearsing for a play that I was in. I was out on the front steps of the building facing north. A bright light appeared in the eastern sky that I immediately thought was a shooting star. It flashed across the sky east to west at a very high speed. It stopped while still in my sight and retraced its path now west to east and disappeared in the skyline to the east. How do they always do that? They're always flying one direction Isn't to that the weird? other. Um, yeah. The next that I recall was just a few years later. I was married and my wife were at a local drive-in theater. It was just, again, a bright light, much like a shooting star. We were parked facing, and the light came from the west and traveled across the sky, headed to the east. And the light appeared to suddenly stop and headed west across the sky, disappearing into the western skyline. This is an event that you just do not see every day. (laughs) 
This was after I had retired from the Army and was probably in my early 50s. I had been to an appointment at the Army Hospital on Fort Knox and was sitting out front of the building on a bench waiting for my wife to go get the car and pick me up. It was mid-afternoon and just patchy clouds. I saw a shining metal-looking object coming out from above a cloud. It was in the airspace above Fort Knox and moving very slowly. When it was fully exposed from the cloud, it continued to move forward still very slow. The sun was glistening off of it, and it was a good bit higher than the clouds that were scattered across the entire sky. Then it stopped motion and appeared to go straight up, rapidly going out of sight. Whoa. A month or two later, I was standing in about the same spot, and the red and green lights appeared in what seemed to be the same location. To the northwest from my location at probably 20,000 feet or so in elevation, this time I ran and got Pat, and she watched the lights with me for a few minutes. Then they again disappeared, and they just blinked off. This last fall, I saw what appeared to be a tic-tac-shaped object in the southern sky moving east to west at about the same obvious speed of a commercial airplane, but it had no wings and was leaving no contrail. A few behind cloud cover, and I lost it. A few evenings before Christmas last year, Pat and I had been shopping at Walmart, and when we came out to the car, it was already dark. We saw three white lights hovering not too high in the sky to the north. It would have put them well over the Fort Knox Reservation. The three lights were seeming to hover close together, and then one of the lights slowly moved away from the other two and headed SSC from our location. The other two just seemed to disappear like they had turned their lights off. There were no running lights visible, just a single white light and sound. Yes, I am old, but no, I am not senile. I know what I saw and something they were obviously flying, but I cannot identify them, so that makes them UFOs in my mind. Wow. Comments, anyone? And of my Facebook post, the official forms that I find on my computer are so lengthy that I hesitate filing them out if necessary, but I can find them. Let me know if it is worth my time. This man's wow. cry for help. Um, <laughs> well, I want to say, like, uh, you know, f- first of all, we believe you, man, out there. Don't on the worry. Internet. You're on the UFO Reporting Center website, yes. sir. And I think that this is something that you commonly see in people that see UFOs is that they, he, he's talking about, he's seen them for 70 years. Yeah. He's seen them his whole life. Yeah, totally. He's recounting all of these and these people become obsessed with, with seeing them because they, they haven't been able to explain it their whole life. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's, that's wild. Yeah. That is Um, like wild to have a legacy of UFO sightings. Yeah. Like that's, that's, it's been happening to you forever Mm -hmm. yeah in all of the places that you lived athens ohio fort knox kentucky radcliffe kentucky and he's now he's he has nowhere to go nowhere to nowhere to put this out to uh he's finally found the new fort he's finally got it here he's posted on facebook what do you what you got oh this one's good dude this one's good sorry 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 yeah no i I didn't mean to no i just think that it's (laughs) it's good that there's this resource for for him out there that yeah. Instead of just like plugging it to Facebook. Fair enough. Maybe we'll get some port. Yeah. That's yeah. Eighty eight years old. Posting on the New Fort New Fort sightings, all of his his life's work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is wild. All right. So this video it says location red boiling springs to ten- Tennessee and that they were taking this video while looking out of a Delta airplane window. So they must have been like flying in. It says they were starting to descend from 30, 37,000 feet. So they were flying in over Nashville uh-huh. and caught video that I was like, what is this? And I played it and you just saw my reaction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You saw that. Um, okay. So it says taking video out of airplane windows, we started to descend from 37 feet, 37,000 feet. I was watching a video I posted online of my plane's descent when I noticed two flashes of light, one coming and one going extremely fast. So fast I did not see it while filming the video. Only a week later did I notice these events while watching the video. Objects are moving extremely fast. It was a clean blue sky. We were just starting to enter the clouds as you can see in the video. Please watch closely and look for the streak of white lights, one coming and going in the left-hand corner, okay? So I know this is an audio podcast, (laughs) but we could try and post this video. I don't know if we just like make sure to credit that it's from New Fork, but this is really cool. Check us out, okay? Okay, so it's just... Oh, wait. Hold on. Sorry. It's just like that must have been the first the, one I saw. Okay, so like yeah. Window where... Looking out this like airplane window. Here in a second, watch right like this area, this lower left right here. Ready? Do you see that? Oh, yeah. 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> That's crazy, right? Yeah. I'm going to post this one. This is a really good video. People are always like, oh, won't you it's catch crisp. it on video? And it's like, because they move at a bazillion it's miles an hour. <laughs> that one was like, what could that have been? Right? Yeah. U.S. aircraft, do they go like that? Yes, yeah, so that was a crazy UFO, right? <laughs> crazy. <laughs> All right, so moving on. I hear you want to uh, talk about something called the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. I didn't read really much about it, so I'm very intrigued to hear why you chose this for the very first episode of what we haven't even talked yes, about. Yes, I was about to say. Is Alien April. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so yeah, uh, I don't know. We've... We kind of mentioned it a little bit, but we, we are recording up. these. I said it. Great. I, I, did, I, did, I also cussed at a did certain you? point. I cussed too. I cussed too. We missed it. Um, we are recording these a lot earlier. We're kind of just trying to ramp up and get used to the the thing. But yes. we are recording these pre-Alien April, but these yes. will launch in Alien April. Yes. This is the first episode of Alien April. Mm -hmm. So obviously our main topics are going to be alien centric mm -hmm. um this was just like a fun one that i came across uh this is the gulf breeze ufo incident really just silly mm -hmm. like it's really painted by a lot of like just kind of like blue collar kind of characters um <laughs> there's a lot of like double crossing and like prankstering things and i will say at the right at the top this has been largely debunked. <laughs> okay, yes. I, that was what I saw. <laughs> so, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident refers to a series of claims made by professional contractor Ed Walters between 1987 and 1988. Ed, and then later his wife, claimed to have been visited by UFOs and extraterrestrials numerous times throughout their lives, many of which he photographed and successfully got published in a divisive piece in the Gulf Breeze Sentinel. Okay. Uh, so one newspaper in the small town of Gulf Breeze, I think that it's at the time, I, maybe it's grown, but I think that it's a town about 6,000 people. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, important to note that when this comes around in 1987, when he first makes the initial reportings, he then goes on to claim that he's been having visitations from aliens his entire life. Okay. This isn't like it started when he's this, it's... I finally got a photograph of them mm. on my Polaroid. This has been happening since I was eight years old. Okay. Et cetera. Uh, the first such incident was, or reported incident, was on November 11th, 1987, from an article in the Pensacola New News Journal. They say, Walter said at about 5 p.m., as he looked out a window at the front of his house, he saw an object he described as right out of a Spielberg movie, hovering about 200 feet above the ground. He got a camera, went out the front door, and took pictures. So this is when he's now starting to kind of take pictures and report on what he's going on and get them published in, okay. in different newspapers in town. Okay. So Walters went on to further claim that he would make several visits to the UFO, that same UFO, taking 32 photographs in all. Whoa. Um, he claims they kept coming back and uh, abducting him. He... Uh, says in his book that he had like a like f his like the front of his brain would vibrate whenever they would start to be around, and that's how Whoa. he knew to get his Polaroid camera and start taking pictures Whoa. of them. Ed's encounters continued, and he experienced many of the calling cards of UFO, UFO abductees. Uh, he claims to have lost track of time mm -hmm. uh, three, four, or five times mm -hmm. in the in this time frame where he was taking pictures of them. Uh, he was partially beamed up what do you mean partially like he suddenly <laughs> levitated and was never uh, like or he would like experience the levitation and blackout or okay. it would start and then he would fall back down interesting okay um, etc something that i learned through this is that a that a common thing that happens uh around grays specifically is a the cinnamon smell. Do you know about this? No. Like, so it's like a sweet, they describe it as like an abhorrently sweet cinnamon spell, smell um, that is just like overwhelmingly strong and kind of like gross, but like it's like sweet. Weird. Um, so he describes that. So this is something that people point to when they're talking about like whether to dismiss him or not is all of these are consistent with what happens okay. 
when you're abducted sure. or what other people say. So at the very least, he's like well researched, researched on the subject. Interesting. He's not just pulling from nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, in one such encounter, he witnessed a craft land and drop off five aliens on the roads. What? Where he then stated that one of the aliens stared into his window. He was driving down the highway at this point. And five aliens got dropped off and one came to his window and they communicated with him in English and Spanish via telepathy, he says, and then presented him with a book showing pictures of dogs to try to connect with him in some way, (laughs) I suppose. (laughs) Okay. By February 7th, 1988, Walters and his wife had reported 19 sightings in total. And they're just what? they're just reporting these to the newspapers. It's specifically the Sentinel who keeps publishing these wow. and having them. Hmm. Um, in his communications with the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, who agreed to publish his photos, he initially went by the alias of Mr. X or Mr. Ed to protect himself from hmm. ridicule, disguise his identity, uh, which comes into play okay. later on. It's okay. important, I think, that he does that. Despite submitting to and passing a polygraph test two times. Okay. Um, Ed was met with skepticism from the paranormal community. Investigator Ray Stanford initially pointed to weather data, suggesting that there was no way that the photos that he had taken happened on the day that he said, because there was clouds or whatever. He was saying, there's no way this. But then that quickly came out that he had the wrong day. Okay. And so the weather was, in fact, correct. <sighs> um, so that's one. It's just straight. like people, but people were like ready to not believe him right out the gate. Right? Well, Sure. Sure. Nothing's in changed. This, in this small community. Um, Phillips class uh, dismissed the photos as obviously fake and declined to investigate further. As he said, there's just not, there's nothing to it. I don't need to read further into this. And then Robert Nathan of NASA said, many of these images are double exposure photographs, which is what a lot of people use to dismiss his claims because they're, they're, they're like weird looking. They're just uh, like, they're, there's like different lights around them and they, they just look weird, and a lot of people explain it by being it's a double exposure, and some of them are, okay. and some of them aren't. But an important like facet of that is that he's taking all these pictures on like a Polaroid camera, in, right? In the in the late eighties, it which is, is like, possible to double expose exactly. On a Polaroid. But yes. like he's just a contractor. Mm-hmm. He's just like a dude. But to do it, all you have to do is put like tape over a thing. It's not hard. Sure. Yeah. Do you think? But still, like pre internet. Fair. Where you just like know how to do that? Yeah, fair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very intriguing. Intriguing. So Robert Nathan also said he had a feeling that there was some kind of cut and paste on some service. Craig Myers, who is a reporter for the Pensacola News, okay. who is a com- like, this is important, competing newspaper to the Sentinel. Okay. He says the whole time. He was a lead reporter during during the the initial sightings. He wrote a dozen stories on the topic, basically debunking it all during the time. And he later wrote a book on the whole thing where he takes umbrage to the uncritical and sensationalist nature of the okay. initial Sentinel reporting. And then furthermore, salty. the mayor also <laughs> just at the time said, these are fake, <laughs> which I think is funny. Imagine a small town. Mm-hmm. 6,000 people, mm-hmm. two newspapers, one of them <laughs> major. So there's the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, and then there's the slightly larger city tabloid outside of town going, you small town guys are not having fun. There's, yeah. no, <laughs> there's no way that this fun thing is happening to you. I'm going to take you down. Yeah. And then for also the mayor of the town <laughs> feels like he needs to have an opinion about the guy yeah. saying the UFOs are real. Like, um, knock it off. It just really like it's it was like mania in the in the small town. Like mm-hmm. it's there's so many Pensacola News Journal articles from this time. Wow. Like I and when was this again? What was it? It was like nineteen eighty. Okay. Or sorry, um eighty eight to ninety. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like the whole time span of everything is like late eighty seven to early 90. Okay. And they're just, that's, this is like, cool. it's like the talk of the town. Yeah. It's like everybody's whole thing. Absolutely. Um, and then, so now the the rest of the town starts to get into it. This is from the Tampa Bay Tribune. If one photo is a hoax, then they all must be thrown out, says class, 
who surmises that the photographs are too suspect to be real. Mm -hmm. Class reiterates his claim by stating, in 22 years of investigating, I have never investigated or have heard of a UFO case that cannot be explained in prosaic terms. Okay. Just the facts. I deal in the facts, says Jerry Brown, Gulf Breeze's 42-year-old chief of police. Jerry Brown. This is a funny bit from this news. So this is from an article published in 88. They say... I deal in facts, says Jerry Brown, Gulf Breeze's 42-year-old chief of police whose carpet and office smell faintly of cinnamon and coffee. <laughs> Isn't weird. that amazing? Weird. I can... <laughs> that's weird. And to, like, point that out? Yo, that's weird. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's weird. So, it's like, is that a cover-up at this point? Ooh. And the chief of police... And the reporter, oh, isn't it? Cr- <laughs> I love it. I, I couldn't it's believe so it. Mysterious. Um, granted, any place, anytime, anything can happen to you. But why would people call about a prowler and not be calling about the UFO that's landed in their yard? The police chief what? knows Ed and likes him. Yet Brown says he's concerned about the possibility that one person, as a practical joke, could destroy what's taken so many years to build. Ed supporters, meanwhile, believe Gulf Breeze attracted the unknown visitors because of the reputation the city already had built as a well-off, well-educated, open-minded community. There is a direct correlation between education and the acceptance of the UFO phenomenon. Huh. So they're saying only dumb people believe us? No, they're saying only the like, opposite. They're saying the opposite. Okay. They're saying this is the community now getting behind. Oh, okay, I see. Where I somebody see. has said the reason why this is happening to us is because we're so smart. Our community is amazing. <laughs> I love it. We're we're business driven. We're well off. Hmm. We're we're wealthy. We're smart. We're educated. That's why they're coming. They got something to say. So Donald Ware says that he's the director of MUFON at the time. Ooh, I am convinced the reason one man was given so many photographic opportunities is because the aliens wanted us to see those pictures. <laughs> all right. There so it is. at this point, all these people start to start to be like, OK, all, this is a small town. Now this guy, we have this guy saying you guys are a great community. That's why you're seeing all these UFOs. Hmm. So, and they published the pictures in the Sentinel. This is all going on. All these other people in the community start to have their own sightings because whether you want to look at it like this is real or this is not, at least they're influenced by the fact that they're being told the reason this is happening to them Uh because is because they're town rules. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so now they're all huh. going, I see the aliens too. So this from just from Wikipedia. Various reports described an orange glow, orange or blue beams of light, and an oval or oblong craft. One woman reported being awakened at 2 a.m. to find an orange lit UFO in her yard. In July 1988, Fenner McConnell and his wife Shirley claimed to have seen a disc-shaped airline with no wings flying over water with landing lights shining on their pier. Shirley, Shirley later recognized the alleged craft from the Sentinel articles. So this is an example of somebody saying, oh, I saw that and it mm-hmm. stayed in my mind. And then when the article got published, mm-hmm. they went, that's what I, that's what I saw. That's mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. Um, and that continues to happen. Pretty sure that's called confirmation bias. It, exactly. <laughs> um, the sightings continued with Brand Pollock. A Gulf Breeze council, councilwoman claimed to have seen an orange light in the tree tops alongside the Pensacola Bridge. She would later to come to find out that Ed had seen and photographed the same incident. Hmm. So that's, an, that's the same. That's they interesting. They keep seeing him. In this exact one, it's like she saw it, went and told her husband, and her husband was like, oh, I was just hanging out with this guy at yeah. Walters, and he was talking about that. And then we all left to go get hot chocolate, literally. That's what they say. <laughs> Respect. And Ed Walters was just there by himself, and they saw a flash, and he's like, I saw another UFO while well, you guys were gone. <laughs> Took a picture of it. And and then, yeah, and then they connect the dots Whoa. in that case. Hmm. Commissioner John Broxon claimed that he and others saw something bright hovering about his home, parade of lights of a different color and intensity. Jeff Thompson, while playing with his 12-year-old son, watched a large craft remain motionless in the air for up to 10 minutes outside their house. They grabbed a flashlight and approached the craft when, just as they were 30 feet or so, the whole top of the craft turned white, made a crackling nose, and then just dissipated. Dude. Which is crazy. Wow. It's just interesting, though, to see all this stuff. Like, these are direct articles from... 
like direct from articles from 1988, 1989 yeah. around this and see how like nothing's changed. Mm-hmm. Like it may, and whether or not, like I, doubt, I sincerely doubt that some of the people that are currently seeing UAPs and UFOs uh, that we see in like the military mm-hmm. reporting that are saying the same thing yeah. as this are like pulling from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the things that are common among them that are weird that are not I wouldn't even say like largely notable, like the cinnamon thing. Uh-huh. Like that's not just something that just like the every man knows. Yeah. Or the fact like you brought up earlier where they go east to west, they zap, zap, zap. Yeah, that's like so that. Strange. Um or hovering in one place and then disappearing yeah like like exact like almost exactly like in the video that you just showed yeah so i just think it's wild to think that at the very least this has been consistent for this amount of time Mm -hmm. um okay so now this is where the story kind of comes to a halt so this this town they've they've done this um they've They've all kind of got around, got around him. And something that happened is that MUFON really, really supported him. Okay. And then the Center for UFO Research, I mm. want to say it's called that exactly. Okay. We're like, no, like that's, he's not the deal. Huh. Um, this is from the Pensacola News Journal, which again has been right, publishing these takedown articles this whole time, like kind of every like few months. Love um, it. So it says, UFO photographs taken in Gulf Breeze may be a clever, complicated flim flam. Boo. Love that they just use flim flam in there. Uh, or they may be visits and contacts by alien contacts that, if proven, would reshape the priorities of governments, assault religions, and threaten the lofty human ego. Some researchers see flaw in the photos and denounce the photo- photographer's story. Others say there are no flaws and no inconsistencies. So far, there is no hard evidence of a hoax. Moreover, a Pensacola fo- polygrapher examines that the photographer who took the dozens of photos believes what he says and believes his photos are real. Interesting. So, he has, during this whole period of time, aced with like flying colors to polygraph tests. Right. Uh, but all that really, really means. Is he believes what he said. Is saying. that he really, yeah, he believes his lie. Uh huh. And that's it. So uh, I, I think it's worth, it's notable that he did, but I think that you got to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, for sure, there are claims of seeing unidentified flying objects, there are photos of crafts in the sky. Photos of blue beams, claims of terrorized citizens, claims that creatures spoke to a Gulf Breeze man, and the creature looked in his window and that five of them walked towards him down a road. He says a humming in his head heralds the arrival of, of UFOs. Gulf Breeze Mayor Ed Graith III is among the many who say flatly that this is a hoax. But no one has actively proved the contacts or the photos or statements of the man who first saw them to be fakes. In fact, Bruce Maccabee, an optical physicist who works for the Navy in Washington, a respected scientist with a quarter of century, century of degrees and research credits, says of the Gulf Breeze photos, I think there is a good chance it's the real thing. Cool. Is Maccabee, despite his credentials, a kook? I love kook, flim flam, in this late 1980s article. Okay, so anyways, this is when it starts to crumble. Like I said, MUFON supported him. The Center for UFO Research didn't. They kind of went back and forth for a while. And then Ed and his wife move away. They move from, from Gulf Breeze. So in June 1990, a model closely resembling the UFO that Ed Walters and had claimed to be a photograph was discovered by new residents of the home that Walters and his wife had lived at at the time. Mm-hmm. The model was made of four plastic foam plates and drafting paper that was hand-signed by Ed Walters. Ooh. So, yes, because he was a contractor. So his drafting plans for a house that he was going to be that it was going to be built. Oops. Furthermore, the Pensacola News Journal claims that they were able to nearly duplicate some of the photos of UFOs Ed had claimed to be taken with the model uh-huh. that they received when the new homeowner gave them to them. Huh. So, Ed doesn't want to take a polygraph this time. Uh-huh. Signs a sworn statement that he doesn't know where it came from. So does his neighbors. However, 
his wife talks to the news again and says that a neighbor told her that a stranger with an out of state license tag entered the garage, pulled the attic stairs down and entered the attic and then left suddenly. So what they're saying what? is somebody planted this. And then this is corroborated by the fact that the drafting paper with Ed's signature on it was not for a house that was not built until two years after the initial <gasps> photograph. Oh, snap. So it's not even like it's, it didn't exist. It didn't exist. So, wow. so this is a model made well after the fact of the, of any of the sightings, any of the photographs. That wow. he took. And it's, <laughs> it's, complete, it's completely like within, I would say, in the realm of possibility, but also likely mm-hmm. that somebody would be doing this to take them down. Mm-hmm. Or like it's, it's, you want to be like, oh, it's a plant. Dude. But like, and that seems unlikely. Oh, but in this scenario, this information campaign, <laughs> it, it like is. Wow. Um, so who put the plant there? Wow. Right? Um, Some theories point to a local election in which Ed Walter's opposing candidate was incentivized to defame him. And also, furthermore, the Pensacola News Journal, Mm -hmm. who the whole time Mm -hmm. have been defaming him, published all the whole takedown now where they had the model. Mm -hmm. And then the Sentinel, which initially they had every like intention to try to discredit the Sentinel and make their photographs look bad from the beginning. This isn't like a crazy amount of time. It is only like it's three years Uh total. But you got to think about three years like in 1980s time. Uh Uh-huh. So so all of this is kind of happening where like from the model discovery to Ed Walters being in this small election mm-hmm. where his opponent is then using this as being like, what is this guy? Yeah, of course. And and then I think I, I couldn't I, like actually figure out like if this was the same people, but one of like Ed's kids, like his son's friend, I believe was like running opposed to him in the election. Weird. Like Ed's son's friend's dad. Oh, gotcha. So you know what I mean? Okay, yeah. So Ed's kid's friend's dad was running a post, got his son to say Ed was, he made this up. He Mm -hmm. was a prankster. Whole thing. So people are saying Ed's a prankster, does this. This is kind of his thing. I think that it's a little bit of both, Mm -hmm. right? So he maybe saw some of these, maybe stretched the truth on others. Mm -hmm. Um, He has reported UFO sightings his whole life. This guy that we read on the Euphoric website is Mm -hmm. a great example, great parallel to this kind of guy. You've seen this kind of stuff your whole life. You've been trying to get it talked about. You finally go to a newspaper. They believe you. Maybe you have real photo. Maybe you got one real good photo on your Polaroid, you know. Go to the newspaper then, and they, they believe you. They publish you face value. You go, and you got the Pensacola News Journal trying to take you down. Right mm-hmm. after that. And then you, that incentivizes you to go, okay, well, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but maybe I'm going to stretch the truth a little. Maybe I'm going to do a couple double exposures on these Polaroids. Uh-huh. You know, maybe I'm going to make the the <laughs> the truth stranger than fiction. <laughs> right? That's what I, that's what I that think. that fiction? Personally. Then? I think that he has all these reasons to have fabricated parts, parts of these stories. Mm-hmm. And I think that he did some of it. He did a, did not all of it. I think some of it's true, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, Ed Walters received a book deal and sold the rights to the miniseries of his stories for over $650,000. Dang. Um, when Ed and his wife divorced in 1992, they split $2.5 million in assets related to the UFO incidents. Wow. MUFON members held strong to the convictions that the photographs were illegitimate, exiling two members who confront, who allegedly confirmed the hoax, who said they were literally chased out by its remaining true believers. Oh, man. Really awesome. Um, MUFON even held a UFO symposium in its nearby Pensacola starting in 1990, all through the decade, until the sighting started to trickle off. But I believe the true legacy of the Gulf Breeze UFO incidents are from an episode of The X-Files where Mulder tells Scully, the first time I saw the Gulf Breeze photos, I knew they were fakes. Cool. 
and that's that's all I have to say about. I love it. That. that was a good story. <laughs> Thank you. Where did you learn about that? I just was <laughs> just, <laughs> just it's on like the one internet? of those ones. Yeah, that's um, cool. I I've never heard of that one somehow. It's a cool I one. I mean, yeah, very cool. Last podcast has a really good episode on it. Really? Um, oh. There's just like, but there's like, I mean, they obviously go different. It's more of just like a retelling of all of his sightings. Uh-huh. Um, and then just, I think that the, like, the uh, story of the two news guys mm-hmm. duking it out is like a really, really funny whole, whole deal. Yeah. No, that is insane. Like. If it's true that the woman saw some person just enter their space and pull down the ladder to their attic and throw something up in it, that's what. That's well, so so it's yeah, it's one of their neighbors. They think about like I. You always got to think about this through the frame of like not modern society because sure. it's like so different <laughs> yeah. than than now, right. where you don't like uh, pr- probably you don't really know your neighbors. Yeah, that's fair. But like in small town Florida, like I believe because it's right in the Gulf, right? So it's like there, like that's fair. St- like I know one dude from like the <laughs> Gulf, and he's like the nicest, most like f- like friendly guy. Mm-hmm. And so you can only assume that it's like he- everybody knows everybody. <laughs> And then you got these big city folk <laughs> running th- running up into the into the town to throw something up into the attic. Like I just think <laughs> it's so like in all I've never heard of that something was planted and believed it. Yeah. Except for this time. Makes you wonder about the times that we didn't believe it. Well, before we get into my little sidebar i did want to bring up did you know that paul giamatti has a podcast called chin wag have you, you heard of this? you've texted did, did you, I tell you about yeah this? You, i think that you you said that your dad told me about it yeah. yes which I'm gonna be honest when your dad goes hey did you know paul giamatti has a podcast about weird stuff like what your show's about i was kind of skeptical i was it like this like this <laughs> And it's really good. Really? They they usually have like a special guest or like sort of an interview, but it's sort of like a casual conversation with just these very interesting, a lot of times famous people like Billy Bob Thornton, Catherine Hahn, people like this. But it's amazing. Like it's people like Catherine Hahn talking about how everything she knows about cults or like Billy Bob Thornton talking about if he like has seen ghosts. And it's just really great. They've had some really interesting um more knowledgeable like scholar people uh, on there too they had an egyptologist that was one of the first episodes and that was really fascinating so anyway i just wanted to that's interesting shout I, it out. I love his voice and i think that it's I, great it made me really love him and he likes they do some um live ones and he uh does some just like live jamming with theremin while they're like sitting there and it's just really funny and I don't know. Like, I appreciate it. I was like, wow. I, I kind of was kind of like eh, skeptical, but mm. I love it. I don't know. You might, you might Sweet. dig. Yeah. Well, okay. So for my little topic that I just kind of wanted to tell you about today is the Kentucky meat shower. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about <laughs> the Kentucky meat, cha- meat shower all day. <laughs> That's just... dirty. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just going to read this Wikipedia article because it pretty much sums up everything you need to know about the Kentucky meat shower. So this was an incident occurring for a period of several minutes between 11 to noon on March 3rd, 1876. Oh, my God. Yeah. Where what appeared to be chunks of red meat fell from the sky in a 100 by 50 yard or 90 by 45 meter area near Olympia Springs in Bath County, Kentucky. There exist several explanations from blood rain to vulture ejecta as to how this occurred. What is? I know. What is? Which one? Well, I don't know. Either. Even, both. Yeah, I guess. I know. Like. We'll get into the vulture ejecta. Like, oh, it's blood rain. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just a blood rain. We'll explore those concepts for sure. So there exist uh, several explanations to what the meat was as well. And although the exact type of meat was never identified, various reports suggested it was either beef, lamb, deer, bear, horse, or possibly 
Human. Human. So on March 3rd, a farmer's wife, Mrs. Crouch, was making soap on her porch when she reported seeing a piece of meat fall from the sky. Classic. Always on the porch making soap when meat starts falling from the sky. Exactly. So she said she was 40 steps from her house when the meat started to slap the ground. God, I hate that. I hate why. I guess slap is really the only term you could use. But like it's like (laughs) slap. The God. So oh, she, it started slapping on the ground. She and her husband believe the event was a sign from God. Every sentence in this Wikipedia article. Is well, is that bold. not one of the plagues? Uh, blood rain is. I yeah, think. I think right? blood rain is maybe. Uh, a similar event was later reported in Europe, which we'll touch back on in a minute. So most of the pieces of meat were about two by two to four by four inches. The meat appeared to be beef, but afford, according to a first report in Scientific American, two men who tasted it judged it to be lamb or deer. You'd have to taste it. <laughs> what did they say it was? Lamb or deer. Lamb or deer. I don't know if they'd ever eaten human before. So writing. But they say, what do they say? They say that human is, would be like pork. Yes. That's what. True. And that babies are like fish. Is that real? It's true. Cause why like, do you know? <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't know why I know that, but that's like, cause the, the thing is if you ate a oh, baby, no. it would be like, so it's like so tender. Cause that's like, that's what veal is like. Because they haven't been like the whole the whole thing that makes meat tender or tough is how much that muscle is used. Oh, yeah. So like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, like the tougher cuts like brisket, which are like that the front of the cow are tough because it's muscles that the cow are using the most. Mm -hmm. That's why veal is desirable because it's a young it's a young calf Mm -hmm. that has not done very much. So it's extra tender because those muscles aren't tough from being used. Mm-hmm. That's why babies it's disgusting. <laughs> are like fish, they'd say. I think they this- say. <laughs> I don't know. This is doubly disturbing because of your profession. Yeah. You know that, well, that's right? That's why I know. <laughs> like, that's why this is like. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's why all lamb. Do you know this? Do you know if you have lamb, that's a baby? I do know that. Like it's like a it's less than sad. a year old. Yeah, that makes me most sad. almost all the time. It's so like nine good. to twelve months. Like it's lamb is lambs are always babies. Like the lambs that you eat. They're yeah, like, that's what a lamb is. Yeah, it's a baby. Isn't that funny? Not no, funny, but like you know, interesting. It's sad and delicious. Okay. Okay, so back to the Kentucky meat shower, please. Uh, writing in a publication, a man named Leopold Brandeis, it was called The Sanitarian, so it's probably a scientific medica- uh, publication. Leopold Brandis identified the substance found that slapped the ground as Nostoc, which is a type of cyanobacteria. He gave the meat sample to the Newark Scientific Association for further analysis, leading to a letter from Dr. Alan McLean Hamilton. What year is it? 1881? In 1897, I think. Dr. Alan McLean Hamilton appearing in the medical record and stating the meat had been identified as lung tissue from either a horse or a human infant. The structure of the organ in these two cases being almost identical. It's like something exploded. Something happened. Or like maybe a few things. Like why does it have to be like, oh, it's just, it's either deer or lamb or or it's human or it's whatever. It's like, no, it's like a there was a, there was a large explosion. Maybe, it's yeah. It's clearly an explosion. I mean, I feel like they would have put those dots together though. Yeah, but 1897? Fair enough. You know, yeah. you always got to contextualize these with the <laughs> true the the mm-hmm. way the people were at the time. <laughs> so true. So uh, the composition of the sample was backed up by further analysis, with two samples of the meat being identified as lung tissue, three as muscle, and two as cartilage. Brutal. So this Gnostic theory relied on the fact that Nostoc expands into a clear jelly-like mass when rain falls on it. So it gives a sense huh. that it was falling with the rain. Um, in a book called The Book of the Damned, uh, Charles Fort, who I think is the person who 
started like 40 in times and is like who they're referring to when they say 40 and it's Charles Fort, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Um, he said that there had been no rain that day in his first book, The Book of the Damned. I'm going to have to look more into that book. I'm going to open that tab really quick. Um, so locals favored the explanation that the meat was vomited up by buzzards who, as is their custom, seeing one of their companions disgorge themselves immediately followed suit. So it's kind of, I'm like, is it kind of like when you see someone barf and it makes you barf? Yeah. Is that what they're saying? Like when you're like, oh, is yeah. that, do we do that because buzzards do? Like, is that a, I didn't realize, is this like an evolutionary thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> I know. I, I'm curious about that now. So a doctor, Louis Castenbin, presented this theory in the contemporaneous Louisville Medical News as the best explanation of the variety of meat. So he thinks that it was the buzzards. And if so, I'm like, bro, those buzzards And ate the a buzzards baby? all ate all of this. Yeah. Possibly. That's a good explanation. Yeah. I'd say. And then so, they all just yacked in the air. So vultures vomit as part of making a quick escape and also as a defensive method when threatened. Also, do we know what the like area on which this happened was? Like or? where it happened? No, like how... How big of a space? Uh, 100 by 50 yards. 100 yards by 50 yards? Yes. So a football stadium-ish? Is that how much you bring Aren't those 300 yards? I thought it was... No, I think it's 100 <laughs> yards. I don't know. It's 100 don't by... ask me. I maybe it's 20? I don't know. But it's 100 yards, right? Football field? Okay, I don't. Sorry. I'm I'll sorry. It. Different podcast. I'm just trying to think about like the span because mm-hmm. that if it's only that it's only a football field that could be vomit it's extremely reasonable yeah however i will say more interesting rip in the time continuum where people yes. were teleporting yeah a whole like so think about it like the fly style yeah where there's a baby a deer a human Ooh. a horse it's like a chimera a lamb and a chicken oh. all in a booth. Why did they're you say all time, a lamb? They're all time time traveling through <laughs> like uh, like Bill, just... Bill and Ted style, <laughs> and then they rip through and and explode and no 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 implode Titanic submarine style. <laughs> okay. And rain all of their innards in perfect two by three chunks. Love it on this small group of civilians <laughs> in the length of a football field. Uh, I think you just solved it. It's true. Where were they going? I don't know. But I will say that Charles Fort also explained that the flat and dry appearance of the meat chunks as a result of pressure and noted that nine days later, red corpuscules with a vegetable appearance also fell over London. So now they're stuck in a time loop Possibly. where they're trying to stop the initial <laughs> raining of their remains. I think you're right. Over that and now, and they are short circuiting to other places in the world. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so. Solve that one. Get solve ne- it. Next. Next. Okay. So I think for this last little segment before we mosey on out of here and catch you again in two weeks. Okay. So this next. Last thing I wanted to kind of leave us with tonight is about this thing called the wind phone. Yeah. So the wind phone was originally started in Japan and it is an unconnected telephone booth where visitors can hold one way conversations with deceased loved ones. And so it was created by a garden designer, Itaro Sasaki, in 2010 to help him cope with his cousin's death. So he said, when you hear the sound of the wind or birds singing, convey your feelings to your lost loved ones through the phone. Beautiful. Wow. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So the wind phone has since received over 30,000 visitors. Uh, it opened to the public in the following year after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami that killed over 15,000 people in the Tohoku region in Japan. And a number of replicas have been constructed around the world and have um, this this phone booth has also been the inspiration for novels and films. Maybe that's how I like I was like, this sounds so familiar. Mm. Um what so now I'm, I want to look up like 
I might be able to see. So in film, there is an Austrian short film called The Wind Phone, where seven fictional strangers visit the Japanese wind phone. And she, the director who also wrote it, Kirsten, Kristen Gerwick, wrote the screenplay when she learned about the wind phone after her grandmother's death, saying, I was intrigued by the emotional realities that could emerge in this metaphysical grieving space. And so began my journey to translate this beautiful story to screen. And then in 2020 Japanese drama film Voices in the Wind mm. came out, which is about a fictional high school student who lost her family in the Tohoku tsunami, and she returns to her hometown to visit the wind phone years later. Mm. So the director who returned to Japan for filming stated, going there eight years later, you can't see much of the damage. It's been rebuilt, but people's feelings have not been fixed. It's really yeah, sweet. Know. Really sweet. So the reason I bring this up is because there is a wind phone in Nashville. Wow. Where we live. Um, there's information you can get about it. I think it's at deathdifferently.org. And they're working on some sort of documentary. And so the reason I thought it would be maybe pertinent to bring this one up tonight or today, depending on what dimension and time frame you're in, I suppose, is because April 14th through 17th in Nashville, visits to the wind phone will be recorded and be included in participation nice. in a documentary they're doing. That's so, very cool. Yeah. So if you're interested, you can book a time at deathdifferently.org. Okay, sweet. First episode in the can. We did it. <laughs> Special thanks to Jonathan Childers for their sound bed music that you hear all throughout our episodes. You can find him on Instagram at Johnny Crawdad. Mm-hmm. He's been playing out a lot more in Nashville lately. Cool. I gotta go check him out. Go see him play. Special thanks to Michael Eads and We Own This Town Podcast yep. Network for hosting us and helping to produce and put out our podcast. Thank you. Sweet. All right. Yeah, you can follow us on social media at Disney Spell World. Feel free to like reach out if you have a DQ you want to tell us or, I don't know, have a thought about something that you want us to talk about on the podcast. Yeah, give us, give us those DQs. Give us those ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, you got any funny news? You want to leave us a message? You just want to say something? I encourage it. I love it. And please leave us a review. Yeah, apparently that's important Only in this realm. Only if it's a five-star <laughs> Is that five star reviews and some wi- written things are important? Yes. Um, so don't so. treat it like it's like, oh, I, I'm just going to shoot. You got it. It's five stars or it's, don't even do it. <laughs> yeah. Five or not. That's it. All right. Good night, Earthlings. Bye. Bon voyage. I guess we can't say good night, Earthlings anymore. So we sure could. I guess we just did. Yeah. All right. Let's. We can do whatever we want. Bye. Bye.